Would you like to know more about using mind maps to remember books that you read? And I mean, not just remember specific details, but also make connections to your past knowledge you already have, and then build the foundation for future knowledge. My name is Anthony Metivier from MagneticMemoryMethod.com. I'm so glad you're here. I recently was blown away by The Diary of a Bookseller by Sean Bithell. And I wanted to make this video to show you how I mind mapped it, why I mind mapped it, and the multiple connections I made and the new knowledge that comes from this activity. And this video is for you if you want to know more about mind mapping for remembering more of what you read. You like books and you want to understand what you read better by making more connections. And it's also a video for you if you're concerned about what technology is doing to the human brain and you're a fan of long form video content because that's what this video is. So if all that sounds good to you, hit that thumbs up. Let me know you're engaged and leave a comment below letting me know if books are important to you and what your interest is in reading. And also, as I posted after finishing this book uh, on my community tab here on YouTube, let me know what books you're reading. I'm always very, very interested in that. And uh, just to the author himself, Sean Bithell, I thought this was an amazing book. You're a really great writer. And I, you know, thank you for, for putting this together because it's uh, extraordinary and I, I'm sure a lot of work and discipline went into it and it's a great demonstration for people of what daily discipline can achieve. Before we get started, I really want to give you some context about how I even found this book because that's part of how you remember more is you think about the context through which you come to books. So I got it at the book room at Byron, in Byron Bay, in New South Wales, in Australia. And this is an extraordinary place, and I instantly went and wrote a review of this bookstore, which I highly recommend that you do. And a lot of what goes on in this book has a lot to do with the nature of reviews and how that we are destroying the world through stars and commentary particularly commentary from people who are not qualified to be making comments. And so part of the charm of the book is this whole role of commentary. So I think, you know, if you're going to do some a favor, leave positive commentary. And if you don't have anything nice to say, don't say anything nice. Don't say anything at all. <laughs> that would be the nicest thing to do. But I left a very nice review of this book room at Byron Bay because it's an extraordinary bookstore, an amazing bookstore. And I loved it. And I highly recommend it to anyone. And one of the reasons why is that it's so well stocked. And even though the staff there who approached me gave me lots of interesting recommendations, nothing quite fit. But this particular book just leapt out at me when I saw it. There were two copies there. I was actually looking, I was going to get this biography of Einstein, and I thought oh, well, I couldn't quite find it. And there were two copies of this. And I was like, oh, this is instantly up my alley. And one of the reasons why it's so up my alley is not only because I have long fantasized since I was a teenager of having a used bookstore, but I've returned to that fantasy many, many times over the years. And even on my honeymoon with April, we found a book called Rebel Bookseller, why indie businesses represent everything you want to fight for, from free speech to buying local to building communities by Andrew Lattes. And it was in Oslo, of all places, between manufacturing modern Japanese literature and a brief history of encyclopedias from Pliny to Wikipedia. And so... I just bought it and I read it and gobbled it down. I gobbled it down a little bit more slowly than the uh, diary of a bookseller, but I've just always been really super attracted to the idea of having a bookstore. And so that's the context here. And it's really important to share that, not because you have some deep interest in how that I select my books, but to demonstrate to you that by reflecting on these things, you're already setting a stronger foundation for memory. And it, it's really an important part of it all. We all have our story and these things actually take place in locations. So it's really important that this happened at the book room at Byron, that I found this new book. And it's really important that it's connected to a book that I discovered in Oslo of all places. These things matter. They're part of how meaning is created. And incidentally, both of these bookstores are great memory palaces, as I assume this bookstore will be, and I hope that I am able to visit it at some point in the future. So, to get to the actual memory palace or memory 
uh, mind mapping process, and there is a sort of memory palace involved here, as I'm already demonstrating. The memory palaces are the places where the book was acquired, and it's not as simple as to say, well, it was in Byron, but it was preceded by actually a used bookstore that I was first in, in Salmon Arm, British Columbia, and then, you know, other books that I found, such as Rebel Bookseller and my own ideas for eventually, maybe one day, sort of, making a bookstore of my own, which is, you know, who knows if that's going to happen or not. But in terms of the mind mapping itself, here's what is involved for me. I try to think in terms of a clock-like structure, and so I work in clockwise order, and that's by design. I find that it just helps organize the thoughts, but I'm not totally dogmatic about it. I, I like to be a little bit freer and then add things later. Now, there's no clean way that I was able to find to dive deeper into the elements of this mind map and show you how it works and what's going on. So I've chopped it up a little bit into smaller pieces, starting with the center. And so I very, very deliberately and purposefully do not have the title of the book or the name of the author on this mind map. And the reason why is because when I go through my mind maps, I want the mind map to trigger information, not give me the information. I want it to cause me to do some work, right? And if it just says there, The Diary of a Bookseller by Sean Bithell, then, you know, my brain isn't doing any work. And you'll see that I have a lot of words here, and that's not necessarily recommendable for you, but there are oftentimes not images for what it is that I'm trying to convey. So I will put words, but I try to put as many images as I can. But it's really, really important that when I open up a mind map, I'm not feeding myself too much information, but rather I'm triggering or providing a catalyst later for me to get some brain exercise. That is quite important. And the clockwork structure or the clockwise structure helps that. And incidentally, there's a strong relationship here between mind mapping and memory palaces. This is a memory palace in many ways. And when you think of it in terms of a clock with a center, well, then you can see that there are locations, right? There's actual a progression of locations on the page that are inherently themselves memory palace structures. So this is, you know, 12 o'clock, one o'clock, two o'clock, three o'clock. You could call this four o'clock, five o'clock, six o'clock, seven o'clock, eight o'clock, nine o'clock. The point is not that it corresponds directly to a clock, but rather that there are spaces. And when you go back in your mind and you think through the information that you deliberately encoded on your mind map, you can think spatially relative to how you have used a clockwork or a counterclockwise uh, structure, right? This is very, very useful. And in terms of the center, classically, this is the spot where you would encode the main theme. And of course, the main theme here is books. Now, if you do want to know more about mind mapping and memory palaces together, I recommend checking out the link below to my interview with Phil Chambers, how to combine mind mapping and memory palaces. And he is just a whiz at the whole, well, he's a whiz at both mind maps and memory palaces, and it's a great conversation. And go ahead and click share while you're there. We got 82 shares. I'd love to see that go up to 100 and see your comments below. Also on that page is a video about Phil Chambers' book, 101 Top Tips for Better Mind Maps. And I've learned a lot from that book, and it has guided some of the strategy that I'm talking about today. Anyway, starting in the center, I've represented a book, and that is the central theme. But from that, there are a number of things that I wanted to remember from the book, and they connect with that theme very centrally, but they also go in multiple directions. And I'll break that down for you one piece at a time. The first thing that really jumped out at me about this book is the theme of community. And it goes into a lot of things that I couldn't represent with images, such as writer's fairs. I'm not sure what picture you would draw for that. But uh, there's some really, really nice episodes that he talks about. And the one that really stands out is about a, a deaf woman who is an author who showed up and, you know, they were able to vacuum while she was sleeping because she can't hear after she was locked out of 
the uh, bookstore or uh, wherever she was sleeping. And it's just <laughs> unbelievable, right? And it's a great scene. It's a great scene because of the couch and the whole visualization of someone vacuuming while this deaf person or hearing impaired person is not able to hear. Also, there's themes of community that bridge into some of the other things of technology and so forth, like a Chinese blogger who asked permission to talk about the bookstore in a particular way. And there's the whole theme of the neighboring businesses. And I wanted to, in particular, be reminded about whiskey. I could have drawn a whiskey bottle here, but uh, it actually connects to alcohol in a, di in a different way. But just the way that uh, Bithel brings out the community is really profound. And it develops a sense of space in your mind of this town, which... Um, if memory serves, is called Wigtown. And uh, I mean, what a great name, right? Like it, it has the mnemonic built into it. Not every city is going to give you something as visual as a wig to associate with. But in any case, that's another detail that I could have made a, a picture of here, but didn't. And in fact, maybe a place for the wig would be on this globe here, which uh, would be interesting. In any case, I remember it because it's a very simple thing to make an image of. And as I was reading, that is what I saw as a giant wig over this bookstore, which is a great way of remembering the names of towns when you're reading if an image comes to mind. And you know, if an image doesn't come to mind the first time, then you can just ponder it and chew over it and maybe something will come. Also, there's reference to art classes and authors, local authors coming in and doing readings and being videotaped and being on the YouTube channel or the Facebook page of the of the bookstore. And it's just a super interesting theme throughout the book community. So I wanted to remember that and it connects to all the other parts in a variety of ways. And that's what's neat about mind mapping is that you get this multiplicity of connections and you can draw arrows around that show what these connections are. And they ultimately end up creating more and more connections because I started thinking about the my own community, not only the community that I have through the Magnetic Memory Method newsletter, but also the community of when I was myself a small press publisher and did books like Atone Neither Overflowing Claws with Rob Reed and also with Rob Reed Open Letter. And it's pretty funny. I found this listing where you can actually still buy the book and... Uh, it's, it's pointing out that we made it using glue guns <laughs> on silver-coated paper and so forth. And this is all part of a huge community. Uh, actually, a better picture of what that book looked like is here, and it was called A Tone, Neither Overflowing Clause. But it wouldn't have been possible without that. Um, and another element of community that is here is how uh, Bithel has a random book club, which is a continuity program as part of the business, and people just sign up and they are sent random books. And that also reflects back in my own interest to the community that I've created with the Magnetic Memory Method print newsletter, which is a similar sort of continuity program. So a lot of the interest here in the community stuff is how do you bring together a community of readers and in a way that supports a business in a business hostile environment and when you have so many tools that are business friendly but also bring so much hostility to the business at the same time. This is a huge theme in the book and it's really, really powerful how it connects to themes of globalism and all kinds of other things that we'll get into in a second. The next big theme that really is interesting and related here is technology. So one of the classic scenes in the book, and if I ever get a chance to visit the bookstore, I will go and uh, definitely have this as a station in my memory palace. But uh, Bithel at one point shoots a Kindle with a rifle and hangs it on the wall as if it's a trophy from hunting. And so that would obviously be a great station in a memory palace. But the the the... The, the whole idea of readership decaying because of a new technological development and so forth is one that you could go either way with in the book because I myself, I went through a long period where I only read from Kindle and I only started to notice a couple of years ago, I was like, well, I'm actually not really remembering nearly as much and I looked into it and there's some solid research around this that actually they're not very good, not just for memory, but for even com comprehending what you're, what you're reading. And 
that I guess it has a lot to do with what you do with what you've read. So if you mind map from what you read, then I suppose that's possible. But I think that you're likely to make better mind maps from reading from physical books rather than Kindle. Although I think we need to consider things like age and so forth that are really going to play out over the years to come. We don't really know what's going to happen. But when you think of the other instances of technology in the book, such as the author's use of Facebook to promote the store, to deal with customers, to do a bit of shaming of the customers who are out of whack and uh, one of the, uh, you know, there's just many, many examples of how how these people are so against the, the institution of the bookstore in such strange ways and how you deal with that. Like there's an ethics around this and we'll talk more about this because it connects to another uh, big theme in the book, which is the theme of agreeableness that I found quite fascinating. But uh, Nikki is one, uh, if I remember it correctly, I just did this uh, mind map from memory without reference to the book, but she is a very disagreeable character, even more disagreeable than the author as he portrays himself in the book. And of course, he is very agreeable, and you sense this agreeableness, but there's just these battles against customers, against technology, about what, how the technology is changing relationships with customers and so forth, both in the store and online and so forth, and then the nature of reviews that I started this video with and how that, that has pros and cons and just a real degradation and graffiti of online businesses or the online component of a brick and mortar business and how that you need to be agreeable to that even though you we are humans right and we may not have agreeableness in our character and in fact there's something about not being agreeable that gets you to the top of the food chain faster than always just you know bowing your head and putting your tail between your uh, legs and so forth so it's a really interesting issue there and i wanted to remember all that um, it also connects to the whole idea of organization and where things are located in the bookstore. Now, I reserved this as its own little topic in my mind map about mislabeled books and the, the identification codes that are matched up with the computer, particularly with a technology called Monsoon. And I saw Monsoon as a very interesting name, and uh, Bithel points this out, that it's an oddly named software. But it's a software that essentially helps the online book f customer find books that bookstores may have, and it's often down, it's not working properly, and there's a lot of service requests and so forth, and so it seems very stormy, like, like it's always monsoon season. I don't know if that technology is still in play now. Uh, it's been some years, uh, not that many years, but a few years since the book uh, was written, but uh, in any case, very, very interesting that it's named after that, and they may have had a positive metaphor in mind, but it certainly comes across in a weird way. Uh, the other thing about the technology theme is that there's a lot of travel in the book. There's both travel by car and there's travel by train. And this really gets at the core of the history of books and media itself. When I was in university, one of my degrees was at European Graduate School. And when we talked about media, we didn't talk just about the internet or television or radio. We talked about trains and planes and automobiles because how do newspapers get places? Well, they get there from planes and trains and automobiles, right? Part of media is the actual infrastructure of travel that brings the media there. Like it's part of the message. And so the idea of seeing people and there's a scene on a train where someone is yelling loudly about how great their Kindle is, blah, 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 speaking over top of everybody, other people who are trying to read from physical books and newspapers. And he says, ironically, at the end, the only problem is, is that even though my Kindle is so great, I can't read when other people are talking. So, <laughs> it, but the point is, is that this is happening inside a place that brings media to the places where media is purchased. And we consume media 
in transport. And so that those vehicles of transport, be they cars where we would listen to podcasts or radio or trains where we might be reading or listening to radio or whatever we might be doing, they're, they're not only part of media, they are media in and of themselves. So one could disagree with that and make lots of arguments about it. But I think that really it is important to understand that the infrastructure of travel is itself not just a transport mechanism for bringing media from place to place, but it is itself a form of media in many ways. And that's not even just to get into like the advertisement inside of trains, for example, or if you're ever in London, you'll see unusually a lot of books are advertised in the underground on the walls of the different stations. And so there really are media oriented and media in and of themselves in many ways. Another technology that comes in and never really sort of comes to a conclusion in the book is the whole windmill thing. And I believe what it's talking about is harvesting energy from from wind. And so that's that's a very interesting part of the, the technology and also organization and the nature of changing space and adding things to space. So the Kindle is an addition to the book. It takes up space in the world. It changes how information is organized in the world, how it's consumed, and how it's organized in the brain. And likewise, these giant windmills, they change how the collection of energy and the distribution of energy is organized and both consumed and distributed in the world. And so I'm not going to go so far as to say that wind is a form of information, but it does change the landscape. And if Wigtown is a kind of information that people consumed by traveling to it. Well, if it just becomes this thing where all you've got to look at is a bunch of windmills, then people are much less likely to use the media of transport to get to the media of the city to consume it as a property of information consumption through visiting it. So that's all very interesting to me. And so I wanted to remember it. And in this case, I put all that information, all those concepts and ideas into just simple pictograms. They're not even drawings. They don't, they don't deserve that. They're just a, like a square with some uh, letters on it to represent a Kindle. And I should say a Kindle of the era, which the author is speaking of. And this is a gun that's shooting the Kindle. It's, it's in the wrong direction, but you know, we're not going for perfection here. We're just going to what is going to trigger my memory when I look at this and I say, hey, yeah, that was a great thing in this book. Um, this obviously pretty much speaks for itself, but you know, this, I just unpacked a whole ton of information from three little pictograms, right? And you can do that too in your own practice. And this whole mind map that I'm uh, showing you here, uh, this was about maybe five to 10 minutes of creation. And I did it immediately after closing the final page of the book. So by the way, if you're not subscribed to this channel and you'd like to see more mind maps, I'm going to probably make a little mind map playlist and do more in intense discussions of this. So hit that subscribe button. And if you haven't liked this video already, then do so. And if you, for any reason, are, uh, you know, hitting the don't like video, your likes and your don't likes, really, they only count if you leave a comment to explain them. So uh, let me know, let me hear your voice, and uh, you uh, will get an answer to be sure. In any case, um, I want to do more of these mind map investigations in the future, part of which is that I'm actually doing what I hope that you will do, which is that you get into memory what you want by processing it through the big five of language learning, right? And this is a language. This book is its own little fluency of the topic that it's talking about. And in order for me to be more fluent in that topic, well, the big five are reading, writing, speaking, and listening. So now I am speaking about what I wrote about or drew about in this case and uh, sharing that with you, which is part of making it more memorable to me. So I hope that you enjoy that, but there is a self-serving process going on here. And I'm not suggesting that you go create your own YouTube channel, although it'd be possibly very healthy for you to do so, especially given where things are going in the world. And, but you know, you can certainly share a simple mind map that you draw with a friend, or if you're a 
solo person, you can just say out loud what it is that you drew there, explain it to yourself, and that's already going to help your memory immensely. So hope you find that tip useful. Now, the theme here that I wanted to get into was more about organization, and I basically sort of covered it. But one of the interesting things here that I found so profound is that there was a character named Deacon, and it's revealed uh, uh, throughout the course of the book that a lot of his behaviors in the book have to do with the onset, which seems to be maybe early onset Alzheimer's, and we don't realize that until the end. And this gets back to the theme of community, which is why I drew an arrow back to that uh, uh, all the way up here, back to community and the globe and the world and how things are are circulating across the planet because a global ec- epidemic is Alzheimer's and that Bithel shares very openly that, you know, he didn't really know that much about this customer who is one of his most faithful customers and best customers and most interesting customers until nearing the end when it was already too late. The guy was already losing his vocabulary and his organization, his ability to organize information and even navigate the bookstore itself it seems there's a bit of a suggestion there so this is a global ec- epidemic and we know that part of it may have to do with what's called digital amnesia and so forth we don't know that this deacon character is, is suffering from digital amnesia but it certainly is a theme that connects and it has to do with organization the organization of the bookstore the organization of information in books And his inability to find words, which is deeply frustrating to him, has to do with the organization of his mind. So that's a a huge theme throughout the book, and it's really revealed in a in a stunning way by the author and how that how and when that he chooses to to share that detail. Uh, Although it is a diary and it, uh, it it unfolds sequentially in the editing process, he could have chosen to reveal it later. But the the book has a tremendous shape, a tremendous arc and curve, and uh, really well done in that regard. Now, I wanted to remember the thing about Orwell's windows as well. And part of the organization of the book is that Bithel chooses to start each month with a quote from an essay Orwell did on bookstores, and is a really fascinating way of organizing a book really interesting. And at one point, there is a point about how that bookstores are really only as good as their windows and the books that are visible through the windows. So I wanted to remember that as a point of organization, because that gets back to the whole thing about location and community and where in the world bookstores are located, which is why I wanted to have this globe here as well. Um, Super interesting and important point. And I haven't read the whole Orwell essay, but I do want to follow up. And one of the ways that you learn more and you make more connections is when authors refer to things, you follow up. And there's just a, a wealth of references throughout the book. And I do intend to go through it again and follow up with the most interesting references and hopefully read some things. There's there's also a poem that's referred to in the book that I, I think would be interesting to memorize as the author himself does. Um so that's quite interesting as well. The uh, theme of love comes up throughout the book as well. So that I just, you know, represented in a pretty obvious way with a big old heart. And why the theme of love is so important is because it's the love of reading. There's a girlfriend in the mix named Anna. She has a love of the community of Wigtown. She has a love also of writing. She's a screenwriter and she has ethics around that. And also there's budgetary considerations in the projects that she chooses and so forth as represented in the story. And this all goes into the authenticity issue that's throughout the book as well. The love of authenticity itself and there's the love of authentic customers. There's the love of doing business authentically. And it's just love is a huge thing here. And it, they all blend together. There's, there's, there's the love of the world. There's the love of family. There's the love of heritage, of lineage, of the progress of history and the preservation of history through books and where books are located, how they're cared for or not cared for 
where they are located. And then there's the actual uh, love of caring for the books and making sure that they're cared for and all of those things. And then there's Captain, who is the cat in the bookstore, and he also is the bearer of love. And there's not really many scenes of the cat giving love, but we all know that cats are not obliged to give love uh, if they don't want to. So really fascinating material there and a great joy uh, to go through the theme of love throughout the book. And so I wanted to remember that. Also, there's the theme of money throughout the book, which I found really interesting. So there's tax, of course, there's pricing, there's competition, there's paying for the postage, there's repairs to the bookstore, also to the author's vehicle and the replacement of the vehicle and the price of gas and all sorts of stuff. There's comparisons to Disney and how Disney does business, which are really interesting. And there's also just the value of objects versus the value of experience. And this is one of the things that isn't spelled out in the book, but it's really important. It's that people treat books as objects when actually books are experiences. And they are the keys to experience rather than objects. Now, you can certainly treat books as objects. And that's one of the things that Rob Reed and I had in mind when we made books that are, you know, objects to, to look at and that just look cool. We, we, we didn't really want this to be read. And this open letter closed book, it literally was closed. You have, it comes with a plastic knife in the back. So you have to actually cut open the pages. And the reason why we did that is we want to draw attention to the book as an object, as something that is is a physical entity that is not, it is meant to be read, but it is to be read from an object that gives you an experience. So by including a knife that is used to cut open all of the pages, your attention is drawn to the fact that it is an experience that you're having and you need to unlock the potential of each set of pages by doing something physical. So we're drawing attention to the book as a physical object, which we're also doing here by having it in the shape of a guillotine and all covered with paint that is a stand-in for blood. But that's a very interesting theme. But nonetheless, traditionally, books are experiences. And when we buy books and we read them, we are not buying just an object. We are buying an actual embodied experience that comes into us through our eyes and our hands and even the smell of books are a part of this. And so that matters. And it's so frustrating to read again and again throughout the book how customers behave towards the book solely as an object. Solely as an object, as if they're just buying something that has value based on its physical state and they're not valuing the experience of the book. Now, that may be a comment on the fact that a lot of people never read the books that they buy, which is totally on them. It's not the fault of the book or the bookstore. But if you don't partake in the book, then you're not getting the value of the book. And it's quite interesting. I don't know how to resolve it. It is a a paradox. But uh, In any case, I mention it because it really stood out to me and I wanted to remember that. So I did some uh, big Donald Trump (laughs) hair-colored dollar signs here to, uh, to represent that. Now, the next thing is history. And history, too, is is sort of an experience that we want to value and that the author clearly values. So there's family history, there's the history of the region, there's the history of industries, which ties back to the whole whiskey thing, which I I won't get into, but it's a very interesting part of the book. And then again, the history of books as objects, which I should say versus the history of books as experiences. So Bibles come up quite a bit, which is very, very interesting. Uh, especially given that Bibles are probably the most notoriously underread objects in history. I don't think history would have played out the same if people actually read Bibles. But uh, in any case, it's it's very, very interesting uh, that that history plays such a huge role here. And there are some books of history that, that come up throughout the the. The, the, the story that we encounter that I want to follow up on further as well. But history in general is a huge theme here and a very important one. The next thing that really jumped out at me was the theme of the physical body and aging. 
So books age, but so do readers. And so do bookstore owners, apparently. And so there's back injuries that take place. There's glasses that need to be replaced as eyesight fails. And then there's just the effects of alcohol throughout the book, the effects of diet and eating and some really atrocious food appears. And it's just, it's just kind of an interesting and powerful theme that I wanted to really remember because of the books as objects versus experiences. Because our bodies are objects, but also things that we experience as well. And we experience them in different ways at different times throughout our lives. And we can care for them and increase their value to us over time both in terms of the value of them as objects and the value of the experience of living in our bodies, or we can decrease that value by not taking care of it. You know, if we don't take care of our bodies, then our experience, the value of our experience of our bodies goes down and it can go down real fast and be hugely miserable. So even teeth comes up in the book a lot and uh, the whole role of dentistry in, in life and just the body as something that's perceived by others. So, you know, you don't judge a book by its cover or, you know, people judge books by its cover and so forth. There's a great scene where the author has had a, a, a wisdom tooth removed and how he's looked at by other people and then judged by them really reflects on the theme throughout the book of, uh, of the book as objects and how people judge books by how they look, like if their corners are dented or et cetera, et cetera. Well, we as people also become dented and we have experiences that cause all kinds of re repercussions and, and things that we have to deal with as a result of how the body has been treated by others without our choice, without our involvement, without our free will, so to speak. And then there are things that we're, where free will certainly is involved and, you know, we, we have to suffer the consequences based on that. So it's a huge theme. I wanted to remember it. And so that's what this is all about. And I might put a little tooth here later to help me make sure that I remember the dentistry theme or the dentistry scenes. And uh, the other thing, too, the, the point here is, is you can add stuff to your memory palace or your mind maps later. And if you're using a memory palace in conjunction with these, you can also add stuff to your memory palace version of the mind map later as well. And so if this were a magnetic station in one of my memory palaces, I haven't used a memory palace for this, but if I was going to, then I would have a station per theme here. And that station using maybe the pillar technique would just have these images and I would unpack them that way. And all I need to do now is go and add a tooth and I'll, I'll, I'll be able to better recall that. So that's there as well. Although, you know, this is all for my own personal uh, development of the knowledge of the book that I read, carrying it forward, being able to recall the details and then connect them with other books later. So the extent to which I, one goes and does this additional work later is all up to personal preference and what you want to use it for. But if you go through this process, you're guaranteed you will remember way more from this book merely by having drawn the mind map, even if you never revisit it again. And again, this is like a five to 10 minute process. And uh, this is all purely from memory. I didn't actually go and refer to the book itself, I do want to reread it again and perhaps potentially make more mind maps out of it in the future. Now, the last theme we already sort of went through, which was agreeableness. And one of the things uh, that's important here in terms of making connections to uh, other books and then furthering connections in the future is that it's really Jordan Peterson that brought to my mind the agreeableness theme because ever since I had discovered it in what he's been talking about on his YouTube channels and our channel and all the channels that he's featured on I was like yeah that is a huge theme so it has a origin a history in my in why I'm even thinking about it in the first place and that is something important to acknowledge I didn't need to represent it here but just so you know, going forward, I if I ever write about agreeableness and memory or make a video about it, then now I have this book to draw upon as an example of a theme that I picked up from Jordan Peterson. And it, it, it's, it's how connections are made. It's how knowledge is made. And you mine them for details and you carry what you mind with you in your memory and move it forward throughout history. And that's what books do. Books are awesome for this purpose and they're absolutely wonderful in every regard. And it's all the more so important and impressive 
when they are in print. And this brings us back to the whole thing about agreeableness because a lot of people are really disagreeable to the idea that print books still matter, that they're important, that we need them, and that we should preserve that tradition. They're very pro digital everything, the cleanliness of it all. And there's appeal to that. There's certainly something that is appealing about it, but it's also just, it's a sanitized world that is, is, is not conducive to the human brain. So you may have heard Will Self talking about the Gutenberg mind and, and all that. And I think that he's right to say that things may be changing. And by the way, he's not a very agreeable guy. I really like watching him because <laughs> uh, he's he's quite saturnine, I think, in many ways, um, which is good for us. It's good for us and it's healthy to encounter critics as long as they're trained critics. And that's really the ultimate sort of thing that I, I think comes to me out of this book and the theme of agreeableness is that there are a lot of people who are super critical but have no training in criticism. So the internet has made it possible for people to leave reviews, starred reviews, and they just don't have the connections in their mind often to even know what they're talking about. Now, I, I heard Scott Adams talking about the ways by which one is qualified to comment. And he's quite right to say that all people are qualified to comment relative to their experience. And we shouldn't shut down this or that comment from people because there's a lot of common sense that the everyday person certainly has and they have the right to and the way the technology works opens up that right to spout off as they please. And they certainly do not have any obligation to be agreeable about the things that they say. But on the other hand, there is a, an art and a craft and a skill and even a science to criticism. And people used to be trained in criticism. And there were styles of criticism. And we were able to go to tastemakers and hear their thoughts and they would make connections for us. They would help us see context. They would help us understand why this or that movie was worth watching or why this or that book was worth the time spent in reading it. But more than that, they would help unhide details that we couldn't see for ourselves. And we could rely on that in a way that we can't from someone who goes onto Amazon, leaves a one-star review and says, uh, you know, a bunch of stuff about why this book isn't worth reading because they personally didn't like it. And they give no context, they create no connections, and they're basically just waxing from and making arguments from experience. And that experience has tremendous influence on buyer behavior because we know that one star review has more impact than 500 five-star reviews. It just does. And it, it puts a mar on things. And, you know, I have often very fascinating discussions about how the review system could be fixed or improved and so forth. I'm not sure at the end of the day that it needs to be, but I'm also not sure that the cream is going to rise to the top, as many people say. There's a really bad cliche that, you know, a rising tide raises all ships. Well, no, actually, <laughs> a rising tide can also sink a lot of very good ships. And it can cause holes to appear in ships that uh, are just fine without the tide rising and so forth. So there's a lot of cliches and, and so forth. And I see a lot of really good memory books, for example, that are just torn asunder by people who just simply aren't qualified to know what they're handling. And I see, I see it happen again and again and again. But more importantly, I am myself am affected by it. And I, 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 I just dislike it. I dislike that I, I am affected by it even more than I dislike that other people are affected by it because we don't have the chance anymore to form our own opinions. And we, I mean, again, it's, it's, there's pros to it. We, all, we also are in, are in some sense more informed, but are we more informed by the right people? Are we being swayed by the right people? Are we being swayed by enough people? And are the, of course, the trained critics are probably the least likely to be writing Amazon reviews. You know, they, they 
have to make a living. And so they're going to be writing them in places for which they're paid, which the majority of people aren't going to find their way into, which kind of leads back to the whole thing about community that we started with. And, you know, one of the problems that we have now are echo chambers, and we've always had them. So the people who read The New Yorker, they would have New Yorker type influence on the kinds of books that they read, the theater plays they went to see, the movies that they saw, and so forth. And we really haven't gotten away from any of this <laughs> at all. If anything, it's been accentuated by the internet, which has the promise of freeing us from it. And at certain periods of the short internet history so far, we've had these moments of being free and exposed to many more ideas and views and so forth. So to sort of sum up one of the neat things here, and it's why I put this postcard, is that Bithel has a thing where people send postcards to the bookshop and there are some images in the diary of a bookseller that show some of these postcards. And what's so interesting is that as the internet picks up speed and gets stranger, like the Joker says in <laughs> in one of the Chris Nolan Batman movies, you know, whatever doesn't kill you only makes you stranger. It's it's really interesting and strange that postcards are one of the most direct and immediate and impactful and influential ways that people communicate with this bookstore in Wigtown. You know, it's it's really really interesting and it and and it's the most interesting thing that ends up getting shared on the Facebook page, or at least I've scanned through it since reading the book. And, you know, it's just, it is the most interesting thing, really, that this old technology is the most interesting thing shared on the new technology. And I see that as a great hope. And the whole thing, like the random book club, that people just would place their trust in someone else to send out books that they didn't choose and, and and gladly, cheerfully pay for that service as a subscription. I think that's really amazing. It speaks to the power of community. It speaks to the power of trust. And it speaks to the power of the physical book as a thing that still surprises us, that still contains so much value, so much ability for uh, us to connect with one another as human beings and to have connections thrown at us out of the blue in ways that are in many ways superior to the random tsunamis of information that are thrown at us from the internet that are often very empty and have no connection. So that's a really, uh, I'm not sure what to conclude with that. And I'm not sure how exactly to say what's going to happen in the future. But I see that we have the opportunity to recognize that not much has changed in many ways. And what has changed is giving us the value of tradition in ways that is so necessary and needed. And we, are, we have a great hunger for connection. And that hunger is satisfied by community. It's satisfied by, by community in ways that online communities cannot satisfy simply because the the value of the object versus the value of an experience is so profoundly different and experiencing things on the internet is still experience but it's lacking in the chemicals that are produced by the brain when we have interactions with physical objects and with other people who have bodies that are changing over time and we need to be able to not only interact with them, but be confronted by them. And the more that we are in our own little caves, not interacting with other people, the more shocking and hard to deal with real life interactions becomes. And so all I can say is if you'd like a great book that explains this and demonstrates it through the lens of being the owner of a used bookstore, then look no further than The Diary of a Bookseller by Sean Bithell. I think it was just an amazing book. I won't forget it. I won't forget it not only because I wouldn't have forgotten it anyway, but I took great pains to make sure that I don't forget it. And I took pains to remember 
why that I was attracted to it in the first place, how it connects to my own life. And I hope that there's an opportunity, if we're not already connected, for you and I to connect because I enjoy this experience of creating content like this for you very much. And if you enjoyed it, I hope you hit that thumbs up button. Just as a brief announcement, the March 2018 Mastermind video is up. If you're in the Magnetic Memory Method Mastermind, my own little community for the real serious memory fans, this is there. All of this is explained, what it means, how you can use it. It's kind of weird, kind of strange, but very, very powerful if you know about bridging figures then you're going to want to know about this way of using bridging figures that has never been discussed before outside of the Magnetic Memory Method Mastermind. And if you are not in that community and that's not for you, but you'd like books sent to your home, then you can still get the March issue of the Magnetic Memory Method newsletter. It's print, it comes to your home, and it this month in March 2018 is all about mega memory palaces versus mini memory palaces and the whole techniques involved in using macro and micro stations. And I will send you a copy of The Memory Connection, a step-by-step -step guide to memory improvement that lasts, which is available exclusively to subscribers to the Magnetic Memory Method print newsletter. So I'd be very excited to send that to you. And so that's at magneticmemorymethod.com forward slash connect. And that is a way that I have been trying to combat digital amnesia for people who are serious about improving their memory. They need an extra prompt. They want something to appear at their door. And that has been going on now for seven months. And it is just an absolute blast. I, have, I really appreciate all the people who have subscribed to that. And uh, well, there are some memory books that are uh, talked about that you may have never heard of in this subscription. So I don't send you those actual books as, uh, as Sean does to his people, but maybe that is a possibility going forward. So summing up memory and mind mapping, they go hand in hand. They're super, super powerful. I highly, highly recommend that you check out the interview with Phil Chambers for more about mind mapping and how you can combine it with memory palaces. But as a brief sum up, oh, and definitely get his 101 Top Tips for Better Mind Maps. It's a neat little pamphlet. I noticed that he actually made a version for Kindle. If you want to have a Kindle, but watch out. Sean, Sean Bithel might shoot it if he sees it. <laughs> but uh, in any case, as a, uh, it's a great book no matter how you get it. It's a great book relative to your application of it. So check it out and uh, do consider making your mind maps in clockwise order. And uh, if you're ever in Byron Bay, check out the book room at Byron. And if you're ever in Wigtown, look up Sean Bithell's bookshop. All right. Thank you for watching this video. I hope you enjoyed it as much as I enjoyed making it for you. And if you do not have my free video course on how to create memory palaces, then go to magneticmemorymethod.com forward slash YT. It is your portal to more information about the different things that I do, but also a free course for videos and worksheets. You can actually type into these worksheets. They take you through memory palace creation and construction. And then later on, there is more stuff as you develop your skills with memory. Again, thank you for watching. And until we have a chance to speak again, keep yourself magnetic.